Welcome back. Hope you're feeling refreshed. And we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Mariana and Alves Pereira. Very good. Alves Pereira. Uh, I'm trying my best. That's very good. Very good. Mariana holds a BS uh, in physics and a master's in biomedical engineering and a PhD in environmental sciences. And since 1988, she's been a member of a multidisciplinary team studying the biological effects of infrasound and low frequency noise. And if there's any problems with noise, let me know. I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> right, let me just get this going here. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Um, so I'm going to be talking about something a little different than uh, ionizing radiation, but internationally it's classified as non-ionizing radiation, which is infrasound. I have to put this slide up, not for you necessarily, but it's just an integral part of my presentation, and I'm sure you'll understand why in a moment. So I'm going to be talking about 30 years of research. I've picked and chosen some of the stuff that I'm going to present. We're not going to be able to cover 30 years of research in 30 minutes, but basically these are our milestones. So the studies began in 1980 within the Portuguese Air Force. In 1987, we had an autopsy. The lead uh, medical officer in the Portuguese Air Force happened to be a pathologist, hence the autopsy. In 1992, we began animal laboratory studies. In 1999, we actually defined the clinical evolution of the disease that is caused by excessive exposure to infrasound and low frequency noise. In the year 2000, we began receiving complaints from residents, private people, who started calling us, please come to our house, we have a problem with noise. In 07, we documented the first wind turbine case in Portugal, and in 2016, we finally got equipment to actually quantify the agent of disease, which until now has never been properly quantified, and I will show you. So what are we talking about noise? Noise is an airborne pressure wave. Basically, the World Health Organization calls it an inanimate mechanical force. So when you're in a noise environment or in an infrasound and low-frequency noise environment, your whole entire body is being bombarded by inanimate mechanical forces. These forces are varying in time, their frequency is varying in time, and their amplitude is varying in time. So as you can imagine, this is not a very easy thing to quantify. To give you an idea of what a noise environment is like, this particular noise environment is uh, in the vicinity of a wind turbine farm in Australia. I hate to call it farm, a wind turbine development in Australia. Um, as you can see, there's something here that hardly moves, and then there's this bar on the right which is constantly moving. The bar on the left is what legislation tells you to measure, and the bar on the right is what you're actually getting exposed to. So this is one of the major problems. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. I'm sure you've all heard about a decibel or a DBA. Well, what's hardly moving is a DBA. And what you're actually being exposed to and what you're seeing here is measured in DB linears, which means without the A. Oops, there we go. So um, usually I have to explain this, uh, but here I guess it might be redundant. Low frequency noise has a, a major difference between high frequency noise in that low frequency noise and infrasound can penetrate into buildings and it can penetrate into the ground. Now, when we're talking about hearing noise, so acoustic phenomenon that we can hear, we're talking about wavelengths in the orders of centimeters. That's why the glazed winds or the double glazed windows, they work, because it's in the order of centimeters. When you're talking about infrasound and low frequency noise, the wavelength is in the order of 17 meters. 20 hertz is considered the limit of our hearing threshold. So if you really want to uh, create a barrier that would uh, protect you against something at 20 hertz, that barrier would have to be 17 meters thick. If you go down to one hertz, that barrier needs to be 343 meters thick. So, of course, under these circumstances, protecting against infrasound and low-frequency noise becomes a huge problem. Now, here's where I love that I have this audience here. <laughs> With the radiation spectrum, we segment 
We even have within the UVs, we have the UVAs, the UVBs, and the UVCs. We can actually pinpoint what frequency affects which types of tissues and which types of cells. Not so with the acoustic spectrum. With the acoustic spectrum, we have audible, which normally is considered between 16 and 20 hertz, up to 16,000, 20,000 hertz. And then we have ultrasound and infrasound, and that's it. Now, when you think about that tissues and cells have their own acoustic resonances, how are we going to study which frequencies are the most, are, are most bad or the worst for human health if we're not even segmenting the acoustical spectrum to get that sort of detailed information? So this is one of the huge problems that we've had over the past 30, it's actually more than 30, but over the past 30 years in trying to determine which are the frequencies that are most important to mitigate if we want to protect human health. That's problem one. Problem two has to do with this DBA metric. DBAs, um, internationally, we measure noise and low frequency noise and infrasound with this DBA. So let's see how much sense that makes. DBA was developed in the 1920s uh, within the telephone era, where the idea was to um, uh, get the best frequencies for speech intelligibility. We found that between 1,000 and 10,000 hertz is where the humans hear extremely well. So if we want to protect humans against noise, the traditional idea is we have to protect their hearing. Hence, the DBA was developed, and what does this mean? It means that if you measure an acoustic environment with this DBA, if you are looking at frequencies between 1,000 and 10,000, it's practically a straight line, which means it goes over there to a zero. It means that what your machine is measuring and what is actually present in the environment, the difference is zero. This is great to protect human hearing. Indeed, human hearing occurs, majorly occurs within these frequencies. But now when we go to infrasound and low frequency noise, look at 10 hertz. It's 70. With this DBA unit, which is worldwide legislated, when you measure 10 hertz with this DBA unit, the difference between what you're actually measuring and what is there is 70 dBs. This is insane. You are not quantifying anything if you're measuring with this sort of unit. But again, legislation, this is what they tell you to do. What our group since 2016 has been doing is we use an equipment that measures absolutely linear, meaning at one hertz, the difference between what is there and what we're measuring is zero. At 10 hertz, the difference between what is there and what we're measuring is zero. So this machine is uh, completely independent of legislated parameters. It must be if we want to actually quantify the agent of disease. So, let me give you an example. This is in Denmark, it is a mink farm, where four wind turbines have been placed close to the home. You have the distances between uh, the home and the wind turbines. This home has been abandoned. The uh, man who owns the mink farm for over 30 years, he's owned the mink farm, uh, he needs to constantly go back to the mink farm to take care of the animals. While we were there, um, we measured in two locations beside the home. We measured in two locations where the animals were kept. In the interest of time, I'm only going to show you the results of location two. As you can see, the sheds, location two refers to a shed that is more modern than in location one. So this is what legislation tells us to measure. Here we have the acoustic environment, as per legislation, without rotation of the wind turbines. And here we have the acoustic environment as per legislation with the rotation of wind turbines. What you see here in red is the only thing that legislation cares about. It has no interest in this. In fact, it doesn't even measure it because we're using the DBAs. So this is really what you're exposed to. The gray bar shows what you're really exposed to, but the red bar indicates what legislation validates and what, how legislation considers this acoustic environment. Notice that there is no time element in, these, in this data. 
And so our new equipment, what it is doing, it is scientifically quantifying the amount of low frequency noise and infrasound that is present in the environment. It's the same situation. Here you have the acoustic environment without the wind turbines rotating, and here you have the acoustic environment with them rotating. What is interesting and different from the previous slide is along the y-axis you have time. This constitutes 10 minutes, so this is the acoustic environment during 10 minutes of time. Notice when the wind turbines are rotating, you can actually sort of identify the pulses because as it gets yellower in this uh, image, you have more acoustic energy, and if it were a straight line, then it would be a single tone. But what you're seeing, the variation in intensity with time indicates the characteristics or specific characteristics of being near a wind turbine. There's a pulse, it's always rotating. You do not get this sort of information if you do it according to legislation. There is no time element. In fact, these are 10 minute averages as legislation requires for you to measure noise. So this is problem one with infrasound and low frequency noise exposure, the dose, how we measure it. Now, if we um, look at another way, the same, this is exactly the same um, um, information, the same data. This is without the wind turbines rotating and look, with the wind turbines rotating. Those little lines, they're a harmonic series. It's a mathematical tool with which we study periodic events. It's a harmonic series. The noise of wind turbines fall precisely on a harmonic series. What normal acousticians out there will tell you, oh, well, we can't, there's no way we can differentiate between wind noise and the wind turbine noise. It's ridiculous. Wind noise does not fall on a harmonic series. Not ever. So, uh, well, I don't know about ever, but not usually. So it's very ridiculous to think, and this is what you're told, oh, well, wind masks wind turbine noise. No, it doesn't. I want to point something else out to you. 10 hertz. The wind turbine, this is called the wind turbine acoustic signature. The wind turbine acoustic signature falls below 10 hertz. What do we get with the DBA measurement? We get less 70 dBs at 10 hertz. God knows what happens below 10 hertz. I don't think it's been defined. So this is just an example of the problems we've been having for the past 30 years, trying to actually quantify the agent of disease. And again, don't forget, none of this is segmented, right? So. Um, here's 20 hertz, all of this acoustic energy is all put in one big bag called infrasound. And we have no segmentation and we know that different tissues and different cells resonate at different frequencies, which would be um, expected. So I just have two slides of cell biology. This is uh, perhaps how, how we were all taught a cell looked like, right? A balloon with things floating inside. Well, according to Donald Ingber, who's been studying uh, a new architecture of cells, this is what really a cell looks like. And Donald Ingber from Harvard University has actually modeled how cells behave in the presence of mechanical forces. So cells communicate not only through biochemistry, but also through mechanotransduction, which means they react and communicate through mechanical signaling, which is what the inanimate mechanical force that your whole body gets exposed to when you're in an infrasound and low-frequency rich environment. So it's called a tensegrity. I don't know if you're all familiar with this. It means that um, the architecture of it is based on continuous tension and discontinuous compression. So knowing about this model of the cell, we can start to, oops, sorry, start to understand what vibroacoustic disease is. Vibroacoustic disease was um, a name or a nomenclature given to pathology seen uh, in people exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise. It was a gathering of international scientists and the term was coined vibroacoustic disease. Our group has been working on it since 1980. I joined in 1988. How did this all begin? Dr. Castello Branco, the pathologist chief medical officer at Portuguese Air Force Base, when he was appointed, 
he went to visit all the workplaces of these workers. And one thing that he observed was during an engine run-up test, which after you do maintenance to an aircraft, you put the aircraft on the tarmac, and you run all the engines at different regimes, and there's quality control personnel going around with the checklist. While he was observing what is called an engine run-up test, he saw one of the workers start walking aimlessly, and he was going towards the exhaust of these big engines. A colleague grabbed him, and the whole incident died there. When the ten, uh, uh, test uh, run-up procedure was finished, Dr. Branco went to speak to the guy who had grabbed the colleague, and he said, what happened? You had to grab your coworker. What happened here? And the guy was like, well, we don't know. You know, that sometimes happened. You know, in the 60s, there, we couldn't grab a guy in time, and he died. I mean, this is... The you're telling the chief medical officer this, this is not what he wants to hear. So he went back to the uh, uh, medical center and he looked through, because for him, this automatism, as it's called, this non-purposeful movement, was to him reminiscent of an epileptic nature. So he went back to verify how many of these technicians, aircraft technicians, had been diagnosed with epilepsy. 10% had already been diagnosed, and the national uh, value, expected value, is 0.2%. So clearly there was a problem, and from 1980 until 1986, all the neurological uh, tests of the time, available at the time, were performed on these aircraft technicians coming up positive for problems. Um, many of them had severe problems, and they were aged 40 and 50, and it were, uh, they were uh, results that you would expect to see in a population that was over 80 years old. This is an example. In 1983, one of these workers died suddenly. Dr. Branco, being a pathologist, wanted to perform an autopsy to understand why this guy had died. Of course, the family was entirely against it, and he didn't get to do the autopsy on this dead aircraft technician. But a colleague understood the importance of actually having an autopsy performed. So in 1983, following the death of his uh, co colleague, he went to a notary and he wrote up a will demanding an autopsy when he was dead, when he died. September morning, 1987, seven o'clock in the morning, this man called Dr. Branco and said, I am going to die, I have called the ambulance, meet me at the hospital so we can do the autopsy. <laughs> and of course, Dr. Branco said, oh, come on, you're not going to die. I'm glad you called the ambulance. Please don't worry. I'll meet you at the hospital. Dr. Branco got there. The man was dead. And the autopsy was performed. Dr. Branco wanted to call vibroacoustic disease the Philippe Pedro disease, who was the name of the guy who demanded to have an autopsy. This is a lot of what we found. What I'm going to be focusing on is the abnormal thickening of cardiovascular structures, which we found in <gasps> this man. This man had 11 scars in his heart from silent infarcts. A silent infarct is an infarct that you suffer, but you don't get to go to the hospital. It soon passes over. He died of the 12th, which was such a small scar, it doesn't even make it into the classification of an infarct, which is less than two millimeters. We also found pulmonary fibrosis in the lungs of this man, and we didn't really care. I mean, it was chemicals, JP4, all this fuel stuff with aircraft, we really didn't care. What this man really showed us was that this pathology was certainly not restricted to the central nervous system, not at all. So what do I mean about cardiovascular thickening, or thickening of cardiovascular structures? Around your heart, you have something called the pericardium. It's a very thin sac, normally less than 0.5 millimeters in thickness. And what we have been finding in the pericardium of pericardia of workers and people um, who have been um, uh, submitted to cardiac surgery as recommended by the National Healthcare Service, what we have found is that people who are exposed to infrasound and low-frequency noise, their pericardium thickens immensely. This is the pericardium of a man with cardiovascular disease not caused by infrasound and low-frequency noise exposure, and this is the pericardium of a man with cardiovascular disease caused by infrasound and low-frequency noise exposure. Notice the scale of these two images is the same. I did not make this bigger so you can see better. 
As a biomedical engineer, I could talk for an hour on what's going on here. I can just tell you that the middle fibrosa layer of the pericardium splits in two, and there's morphogenesis. This is a layer of loose tissue, including blood vessels, adipose tissue, and lymphatics. It's not supposed to be there. There's a whole mechanical reason for this, and I'd love to expand on it, but I won't because this is not the forum for it. We also found vascular thickening on the walls of arteries. As you can see, this is the wall of a rat exposed to infrasound and low-frequency noise. It's supposed to be this thick, not like what we found. And this is in a man. This is in the, the pericardium layer, and you, this is blood, blood, and blood. And look at this thickness. It's supposed to be that thick. So what happens when you have particularly a coronary artery, which is very s small, and all of a sudden the walls start thickening and thickening, and all of a sudden blood flow is occluded, and hence the infarct. So this is just from infrasound and low frequency noise exposure. In 1999, we had already studied this for 19 years, we selected a group of 306 aircraft technicians. We eliminated all who had prior cardiovascular disease, diabetes, streptococcal infections, uh, rheumatic fever. At the time, we're talking about in the mid-90s, anybody who uh, smoked too much, which meant more than one pack of cigarettes a day, anybody who drank too much, anybody who was on neuroleptic. So out of the 306 pilot aircraft technicians, we ended up with a group of 140. So if the sign or symptom is on this list, it means that 50% of these 140 clean aircraft technicians developed the problem. So after four years of occupational exposure, at least 70 had bronchitis, whether or not they smoked. After 10 years of exposure, at least 70 had blood in the urine, and so on. And this is cumulative. Don't think that when you get to over 10 years of uh, exposure that your blood and urine stops or that your bronchitis stops. No, it's cumulative. It's just an add-on. This is extremely difficult for the medical profession because a person will walk in and complain of almost every organ and system in their bodies. And most doctors uh, have a, a enormous difficulty understanding what is going on with this patient. And if there's not a high degree of suspicion, the patient normally gets referred to psychiatry, which is hardly appropriate. In 1992, because of the respiratory uh, problems that our workers were developing, we began animal studies in the laboratory. So we used Wistar rats. And again, we're still in the occupational environment. So we expose the rats to eight hours a day, five days a week, weekends in silence. This was the normal time profile that our workers were exposed to. And of course, we simulated their infrasound and low frequency noise environment. Guess what we found? Thickening, again, this time in the alveoli. Again, notice the scale of these two images is exactly the same where there's supposed to be a thin structure of the alveoli, it's getting thickened. So also we studied in the rats exposed the trachea. So what you're looking at is the trachea removed, it's opened, and it's uh, exposed, and it's photographed. So this surface that you're seeing is the surface where airflow goes by. Again, this is the normal rat after exposure to infrasound and low-frequency noise on an occupational schedule, this is what your trachea looks like, not yours, the rats. Again, this is the normal trachea. This is called the brush cell for obvious reasons. These little things sticking out, they're made of actin. They're called microvilli, and they're made of a biopolymer called actin, which is very common in our body. This is what happens with this brush cell and these actin structures after um, exposure and more exposure. They fuse. This is a non-viable cell anymore. So, well, of course we had to study the rat cochlea, right? I mean, come on, it's noise. So, we, this is the normal cochlea. As you can see, you have the cilia that everybody knows that we have in our ears and it's supposed to vibrate when we hear a sound. The spaces that you see here is missing cilia due to the normal aging process. 
So when the sound, this is called the basal membrane, and the cilia are attached to the basal membrane. When the sound comes through, it's the basal membrane that's going to move, thus vibrating the cilia. So let's see what happens when we look at the noise exposed. Not only are they fused, of, this is the basal, not only are they fused amongst themselves, they fused with the upper tectorial membrane. It was not simple to remove the upper tectorial membrane when they're fused, it's fused completely with the cilia below. Notice something else, there's no missing cilia. We have postulated that this is the organic reason for noise annoyance, that which people say it's psychosomatic and psychological and what else. We believe, or we have postulated, that this may be the reason why people feel noise annoyance, which is just much more than just a a small nuisance. Notice that the basal membrane will always vibrate. Only this time, the cilia, they're not only fused with themselves, but they're fused with the upper tectorial membrane. So there's going to be a lot of tugging and pulling each time you hear a sound. Right. Our first case of in residential infrasound and low frequency noise came a documented case was in 2004. We did not believe these people. They called us, please come, where we have this horrible noise in our house. You have to come and help us. And we went. We were very skeptical. Come on, we're used to dealing with aircraft engines. What could you possibly have in your home that could be similar to an aircraft engine? But yet, the people were complaining of the same symptoms. And we gave them the same medical diagnostic test, clinical evaluation of this particular family. It all came up positive just like our aircraft technicians. But look at the sound. This is the cockpit of an aircraft and the white bars and the black bars is what we picked up in this home. This is the view of the balcony of this home and this is the culprit. So we understood that even though the levels are much lower than our occupational exposures, the time profile is much more increased. People are sleeping in this. People are living in this. In fact, the female actually spent the pregnancy in this home under this noise. The son has caught at 10, he's now older, at 10, he had the comparable cardi thickening of cardiovascular structures as our military pilots. So indeed, this is way beyond an occupational only disease. And now for the wind turbines. This was our first documented case of wind turbines in Portugal. The closest, well, this one is 800 meters from the home. This home has also been abandoned, and they started rotating in November of 2006. In March of 2007, the parents received a letter from the boy's teacher. What's wrong with this child? He's a straight-A student, and now he appears to have energy not even for physical education. He's going completely downhill. And this this case went all the way up to the Portuguese Supreme Court, and these four wind turbines were, de were decreed to be eliminated, and they have been taken down. But while the court case was ongoing, more were put up. So the court case was only about these four. Essentially, the man won the battle and lost the war. He, he, he also needs to return there because he has a, a farm breeding. Uh, he breeds. Uh, Lusitanian horses for bullfights. This was the noise, or low frequency noise, still in the old way, that was measured in his bedroom. That's another funny thing. Legislation tells you to measure noise, you know where? Outside in your garden. Oh yes, that's where I sleep, right? <laughs> they measure it outside by legislation. They go outside to your garden to see whether or not you're getting noise exposed. Now if anybody knows anything about structural res resonance, you know that the noise can be highly amplified inside the home while almost insignificant outside. So as you can see, the red bars are the control, so when they're not rotating, and the black and the gray bars is the noise or the acoustic energy present when they are rotating. Genetic problems. The top picture is teratogenesis found in or observed in our rats in the laboratory. The mother had spent the pregnancy in the laboratory. 
These are the horse feet, boxy feet. I don't know if we have horse animal, horse people here, but these are the boxy feet that developed in the bullfighter's home of the wind turbine case I just showed you. These are dead fetuses of mink from the mink farm, frozen and kept for evidence. This is this year's aborted fetus. And this is a chicky and the eggs of turkeys in the same home exposed to infrasound and low frequency noise caused by um, coal mining activities. This is my last uh, topic. It's the winter, our wind turbine case in Germany. As you can see, there are numerous wind turbines around this home. And again, if I extended this to five kilometers, there would be more. This is only up to two kilometers. Alongside the home, you see a lake. Now, in this home, this was their bedroom. It was a beautiful bedroom. You could see the lake through the window. It's been abandoned. This family now lives and constructed a bunker bedroom, and this is now where they live. We've actually gone there and compared the bunker bedroom noise, properly measured without the DBAs, and we compared it with the bunker bedroom. This is what happens in the abandoned bedroom. These peaks at 8 and 12 hertz, which are present in the abandoned bedroom, independent of wind speed. And this is with the same wind speed, independent of wind direction. These peaks are not present in the, in the bunker bedroom. The blue line here refers to the bunker bedroom. These peaks are not present. What are we doing? We're trying to find out which are the frequencies that are most harmful to health. And now we have a machine to actually do it, because if we did it in DBAs, we wouldn't get anywhere. Right. That's my last slide. I had to speed it up. Thank you for your attention. Can I just ask you, are you getting reports from residents on flight paths? Because, of course, it's hugely controversial now, the third un runway, and it looks as though it, you know, it's the old story, isn't it? You've got a relatively small number of air technicians, but you've got a hell of a big population living around Heathrow. So what's your thoughts about that one? Well, in theory, um, the planes can't fly between midnight and 6 a.m. Yeah. So that's a respite that your body can have if you're living under a flight path. doesn't mean it's any better if you stay at home all the time. But it is uh, a slight difference than, for example, wind turbines that are not turned off at night. But I, we're getting reports from people who live in Northern Ireland and in Connecticut, Northern Holland and in Connecticut, who live on top of pipe gas pipelines, pumping stations, HVAC systems. Right, right now, when I go back to Lisbon, there's a, a six apartment building of which five have abandoned this building because they can't stand whatever is now there, which I'm going to find out what it is. I don't know if it's a supermarket or if it's an office space. So I just have an evil question for all of you. <laughs> In all your studies, do you control for infrasound and low frequency noise? That may concomitantly be there along with radiation. So I just thought I'd stick that in. I'm just thinking, uh, fascinating talks, uh, and you have been bad, isn't it? But you seem to be, as far as I can see, presenting association rather than causation. So that, you showed a picture of, a, of what I think was human pericardia, uh, 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 which is thickened. Seen in our first. Do you do infrasound? But I'm not sure what evidence you have that that thickening was caused by the infrasound. <coughs> Well, it was initially found in autopsy. Yeah. We then went into echocardiogram, and we started seeing thickened pericardium in the absence of diastolic dysfunction, so nothing to do with pericarditis, in people who occupationally were exposed to infrasound and low-frequency noise, namely pilots and flight attendants, and it was all happen chance. We weren't looking for them. They just came, it just appeared. Then. Since there was this idea, oh, well, just because you see it thickened in echo doesn't mean it's anatomically thickened. So within the national healthcare system and with the appropriate uh, ethical uh, committee approvals, we took samples of pericardium of people who were by the national healthcare system recommended for cardiac surgery. And those who had worked extensively in infrasound and low-frequency rich environment all appeared with thickened pericardium. Thickened pericardium for exactly the same reasons in each case. 
Then, of course, we exposed rats. Rats don't have pericardia, but they do have cardiovascular structures, which again appear thickened for the same exact reasons. If you, if it's proliferation of collagen and elastin in the absence of an inflammatory process. So at this point, um, we kind of uh, have associated, and you don't see thickened pericardia anywhere, except unless you have pericarditis, that implies an inflammatory process which is not present in our people or our animals, and it also implies diastolic dysfunction if you have pericarditis, which is not present in our um, people. So we also, moving right along, when we studied the horses in the farm, in wind turbine farm, we also found thickening of the arterial walls of the horses. So, and there we have also measured the agent of disease, which is infrasound and low frequency noise. Have you ever seen thickened uh, cardiovascular structures in, uh, in, in EMF exposed creatures? Have you ever seen thickened cardiovascular structures in water poisoning, in, uh, I don't know, asbestos exposure? This is not something that you find commonly. You can have all types of cancer and you won't have thickening of cardiovascular structures in this way of the wall of, of, of the artery. So, Does that mean then, to go back to square one, does that mean that if you were to do a controlled experiment of people living near airports, you would find a higher proportion of those with thickening uh, walls? Well, you'd have to be very careful to conduct this study because you have to get all their prior noise exposure histories. When I interview people, my first question is, where was your mother pregnant with you? Because that's where it starts. And so we cannot compare, just because you're living there means you're gonna get it. Well, you might get it real faster if your mother was already exposed and you were already exposed in utero, or depending on your profession. I cannot compare an office worker's exposure to this type of agent of disease with a pilot, the commercial airline pilot. So when we do these epidemiological studies, which they are doing incorrectly as we speak, and they don't take this into account, and they don't find a statistically significant difference between the populations, and the, therefore they assume, oh, you see, there's no problem. This actually happened in our case in Puerto Rico, where because of uh, military activities or training exercises, we had a whole island of people that were sick. And instead of going to get a control population in a place where there is no infrasound and low-frequency noise, or there is less, no, they went to another island and they chose children that happened to live next to the National Guard's training uh, uh, camp and where the mothers are most of them employed. <laughs> so you see, it's, um, it's, it's very easy to fudge the numbers on this and it's, if you don't know what you're doing, it's very easy to get flawed designs of, of studies. But it's very easy to measure very kind It's not. It's not clinically wrong. Ironically, it's an ultrasound. Um, so you could, you could do that on... on it, there are no uh, established tables of measurements for normal pericardial thickening. If you suspect the pericardial thickening, you'll go, if you're a cardiologist or a cardiologist, you'll go and you'll see if there's diastolic dysfunction. In these people, there is no diastolic, this means that even though there is this really thick thing around the heart, the heart opens and closes fine. None of our patients have EKG problems. So normally, what cardiologists and echo technicians are taught is, if you see echogenicity in the pericardium, check for diastolic dysfunction. If there is none, what is it? Idiopathic. It's not easy, and there's no established numbers for what's normal and what's not. And it's a protective mechanism. Okay. Can I go a step in there? We are yes. stinting yes. well into time. time. I'm so just going to pull this out. What I would suggest is if we hear Mary's talk first, and then we can maybe come back and continue with the questions and so on, if that's okay. Just to make sure, because I don't know what time we get thrown out of here. Um, we haven't been thrown out yet, hasn't we? Okay, so we'll be coming back. We'll usually start by five. Okay. That's okay. Um, but thank you very much. That You're was very, very interesting. You're very welcome. I'm going to try and get this.